Communion elements are not another incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was incarnated only once through the blessed womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and only once. He cannot be incarnated again the transubstantiation. For anything to be a sacrament, there must be a sign. I remember being taught the Roman Catholic Catechism that, uh, you know, the, the sign is, is the, it's, there's the outward sign of inward grace ordained by Jesus Christ. For anything to be a sacrament, there must be a sign, something which it signifies. There must be an outward sign. If, according to transubstantiation, the sign becomes the thing signified, the wafer becomes the actual bodily presence of Christ, then the bread, then it cannot be a sacrament any longer because there is no sign. Pope Pius XII wrote, and the Roman Catholic Church says it is essentially an unbloody emulation, emulation of the divine victim. Then how do they explain that it is literally the actual blood of Christ involved in transubstantiation? If they are offering a sacrifice, Every proper propitiatory sacrifice was bloody. The Mass being an unbloody sacrifice, therefore would make it an improper propitiatory sacrifice. A sacrament is given to us of God as a pledge and token of His love and of what Jesus has done for us. And we as Protestants then look at what is happening in the Roman Catholic Church and we're saying, what God has given to us, you are using as a sacrifice. You are then offering something to God, which is quite the reverse order and something quite different. The Roman Catholics say that the species or the accidents only of the bread and wine remain in the Lord's Supper. By species or accidents is meant the color, the smell, the taste, the length, the breadth, the moisture, etc. of the bread. And these they say, you see, you taste, you feel, you smell and eat and drink, but you do not see, nor taste, nor smell, nor touch, nor drink, nor drink bread and wine you are eating the body of Christ. The essence and being of accidents is to be inherent in the subjects which they are accidents of, or else, logically, they subsist by themselves and are not accidents, but substances. If there be whiteness and redness and length and breadth and weight, there must be some substance that is white and broad and long and heavy or else the communicants must in the Lord's Supper solemnly eat and drink white and red and long and broad and heavy, nothing. But if the words, this is my body, this cup is my, the new covenant in my blood, if it destroys the substance, certainly they must also destroy the accidents for they are pronounced over the whole bread and wine and make no distinction between the substance and the accidents, but speak the same on both together. And therefore, when our Lord blessed the bread and the wine, did he bless the substance with one kind of blessing and the accidents with another kind? Did his blessing on the substance destroy it and at the same blessing on the accidents preserve them? Or when Christ said, this is my body, this cup is my, the new covenant in my blood, can we be persuaded that Jesus hearing said one thing to the substance and another thing quite contrary to the accidents? Ooh. Thank you. 
I, I better just hurry on. I just want to refer, I've still got quite a bit. Uh, I just want to refer to John chapter uh, uh, 6, is where the Roman Catholics have their main teaching on, uh, on eating the flesh of the blood of Christ. And uh, I'll just... In John chapter 6 and verse 53... Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, the verb eat, unless you eat, the verb eat is in the aorist in the Greek. And therefore the one act of eating, not the many acts when we come to the Eucharist, the one act of eating bestows life. In verse 53, and, and that, of course, refers to the coming. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. The eating Jesus Christ, according to John 6, is the looking to Christ. The drinking Jesus Christ is the believing in Jesus Christ, as we have in verse 40. He who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. I better close. I want to again just say to the Roman Catholics, I'm sorry if I've upset you. I, it was not meant that way, but you have so graciously sent me all the way from Australia to present a Protestant view, and I trust that you will accept it from a Protestant. God bless you. Yes, uh, Dr. Logan, I'm j naturally we didn't know what each one was going to prepare. And I met you with the very, very early fathers of the church and with their interpretations, some of those fathers, people who actually lived in the time of the apostles. And the teaching of the fathers, which has, was consistent, all the way through from the post-apostolic fathers right to the split of the Orthodox and the Catholics. I wonder how you relate the Protestant, or this early Protestant interpretation to the fathers of the church. Since the Protestant reformers often invoked the fathers of the church in their objections to Catholicism, they, they didn't hesitate to invoke St. Augustine and others I wonder how you deal with the teaching of the fathers of the church. Thank you. The Didache of the apostles contain, it will be admitted, Eucharistic prayers, but no theory of the Eucharist. Ignatius, in 30 to 70 AD, speaks of the sacrament in two passages, only by way of illusion, but in strong mystical terms, calling it the flesh of our crucified and risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the consecrated bread, a medicine of immortality and an antidote of spiritual death. That is in the History of the Church, Volume 2. In his epistle to the Philadelphians, Ignatius, who is also called Theophorus, to the Church of God, the Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is at Philadelphia. He writes in chapter 4, I have confidence of you in the Lord, that you will be of no other mind. Wherefore, I write boldly to your love, which is worthy of God, and exhort you to have by one faith and one kind of preaching and one Eucharist. For there is one flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his blood which was shed for us is one. One loaf also is broken to all, and one cup is distributed among them all. There is but one altar for the whole church, and one bishop with the presbytery and deacons, my fellow servants. Now, it is true that he speaks of the Eucharist, but he also speaks of the cup which is being passed around, which is not being passed around by the Roman Catholic Church today. In his letter to the church at Smyrna in chapter 7, entitled, Let us stand aloof from such heretics, uh, he writes, they abstain from the Eucharist and from prayers because they confess not the Eucharist to be the flesh of the Savior Jesus Christ to suffer for our sins. Those therefore speak against this gift of God, incur death, 
and there I will concur that according to, um, to the anti-Nicene fathers, you are quite correct, Father, in, 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 in that uh, observation. Um, in his epistle to the Tralians in chapter 8, uh, he writes, Not that I know there is anything of this kind among you, but I put you on your guard inasmuch as I love you greatly and foresee the snares of the devil. Wherefore, clothe, clothe yourselves with meekness. Be ye renewed in faith, that is, the flesh of the Lord, and in love, that is, the blood of Jesus Christ. Let no one of you cherish any grudge against his neighbor. Give no occasion to the Gentiles, lest by means of a few foolish men and the whole multitude of those that believe in God be evil spoken of. For woe to him whose vanity for woe to him by whose vanity my name is blasphemed among any. It is true that amongst early, some early church fathers there are hints, and certainly the very word Eucharist is named, but the interpretation is not consistent by all the church fathers, as we saw just now, be ye renewed in faith, that is the flesh of the Lord, and in love, that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Dr. Logan will ask his first question of Father Groeschel. Father Groeschel, when the disciples were there at the table and uh, Jesus had take, blessed the bread and taken it, when Jesus had taken the bread and had blessed it and broken it and gave to his disciples, um, what did they eat? Did they eat bread or did they eat the, the body of Christ? By that I mean, did they eat the living body of Christ or did they eat the crucified body of Christ or did they eat the glorified body of Christ? Because if they ate the living Christ, they were eating the living Christ who had not yet died and he was still standing in front of them after he had gone into their stomachs. If they ate the crucified Christ, uh, then they ate a Christ who had not yet been crucified, but who was standing alive before them. And if they ate the glorified Christ, well, then they ate a Christ who had not yet suffered, who had not died, who had not yet been glorified, and who was still in a state of humiliation. Now, the question is a very good one, because it opens up the whole problem of mystery. St. Thomas Aquinas, when he wrote about the Eucharist, speaks of a philosopher who studied bees for 30 years. When he got all finished, he said, I still don't understand the bee. Scientists don't understand the bee till today. And St. Thomas says, if you can't understand bees, you're not going to understand God. Part of the mystery of the Eucharist is that the body of Christ and the blood of Christ in the Eucharist is a supernatural body. We see that his body was supernatural after the resurrection because he entered the upper room while the doors were closed. They make very clear that it is the body of Christ that rose, that it's not a specter or a ghost, but it does not have the properties of a physical body. It passes through a wall and a door. It is also the teaching of the fathers of the church that Mary was a perpetual virgin and that Christ was born without the loss of the seal of virginity to Mary. This is a teaching of the ancient fathers. At one point, Jerome did not believe it, but later on confessed that his unbelief was a sin. Now, when we deal with Christ, we are dealing with God. God taking on himself a human nature, a true human body, and a true human soul, as defined in the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon. A divine being is everywhere. The supernatural body of Christ can be in more places than one. And that's part of the mystery of the Eucharist. St. Augustine speaks of that. 
that, that we, though many, receive one and the same Christ. Though the Eucharist is offered in many places, there is one and the same priest, one and the same participation in the sacrifice of Christ. The most interesting aspect of Dr. Logan's question is the question of the sacrifice. Was the body yet sacrificed? Now, interestingly enough, there is no Catholic or Orthodox definition on how the Eucharist is a sacrifice. It is defined that it is a sacrifice, but not how. There are many theories. Probably the most cogent theory in modern times is that the Eucharist is a sacrifice because Jesus of Nazareth comes, not only in his divinity as eternal word of God, but in his humanity as child of Mary with flesh and blood. And wherever he is, Jesus is sacrificed. He is always sacrificed. He emptied himself, taking on the nature of a slave in the incarnation. Always, his entire human life, from enunciation on, is a sacrifice. Jesus comes, that's why the fathers of the church call it a sacrifice. It is not a sacrifice distinct from Calvary. There is one sacrifice according to the teaching of the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, one priest, one Eucharist, many, many celebrations, many, many Eucharistic particles or hosts, but one body of Christ. Impossible to deal with unless you accept the concept of mystery. The reformers accepted the concept of mystery with the incarnation, but for some reason, they were unwilling to extend it to the Eucharist. Father, Father Groeschel will now ask his second question. All right, I gotta look up my second question. They keep us pretty busy up here, Dr. Logan, I'll tell you that. Now, you gave a very beautiful presentation of the Passover. And I've, I've been to the Passover, having grown up in a Catholic Jewish neighborhood. And always at the Passover, there is an empty seat set, and you ask the kids, whose seat is that? And they say, Eliah. What Eliah? Not the old prophet. They sing a song, Eliah, Eliah, Eliah will come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Eliah is the second Eliah, the Messiah. And that second Eliah, who is now at the right hand of God the Father, also says, behold, I am with you till the end of the world. I think the objections of the reformers that Christ is in heaven and then cannot be present in the Eucharist do not stand because all Christians believe that he is with us till the end of the world. Thank you, Father. May I just say to you that it is not the teaching of the reformed Presbyterians or reformed church that Christ is not present in the sacrament. We believe that he is there spiritually, not bodily like the Roman Catholics. And that is where we believe and we would enter into, of course, the uh, section of the real presence of Jesus. Uh, whereas the Roman Catholics would say the real presence is because on account of the, the consecration and the bodily presence of Christ, we would say no, the bread and the wine are symbols of what he's done for us, of deliverance, of redemption, and uh, they are symbols of his body which is given for us and of his blood that is shed, but that is there. The real presence of Christ is, as you've already mentioned one text in Matthew 28, lo, I'm with you always, because there isn't a place on earth or in heaven. There isn't a corner here in this room where God is not present. And uh, so he's present everywhere. 
Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And so we, in the Protestant uh, faith, we don't believe that we have to have the bodily presence of Jesus. Uh, it's where two or three are gathered in his name, he's there. And uh, of course, in the book of Revelation, you know, when John the seer writes, um, uh, and Jesus reveals himself as one walking amongst the candlesticks. It's Jesus in the midst of his church, simply because he said he will always be with us even unto the end of the earth. That is to us the real presence. Jesus is with us by his spirit as we have the teaching in John chapter 16. Because Jesus said to the disciples, look, I'm not always going to be with you. I'm going to go away. But I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will send the comforter. And then he speaks in such terms as if he himself will be back. And that is by his spirit. And so we as Protestants believe that that is the real presence of Christ. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, now uh, <clears throat> Dr. Logan will ask his second question. Father Grashel, could you just explain to us as Protestants? You see, we believe that uh, Christ died once, never to die again. And yet you offer him as a sacrifice there in the Mass. He died as the one sacrifice for sins, and yet yours is a propitiatory sacrifice. He died, and then he sits at the right hand, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead, as the Apostles' Creed tells us. How do you explain that in terms of, say, a bodily presence of Christ in, in the uh, wafer, when we believe that the bodily presence of Christ can only be in one place at one time, whilst he's everywhere by his Spirit? The way I explain it is it is a supernatural body. This is part of the mystery of the Eucharist. Remember, Christ is a divine person. According to the Council of Chalcedon, he is not a human person. He's a divine person with a human nature and a divine nature. And consequently, he has qualities of divinity as a human person. I think that the reformers badly misunderstood Catholic teaching, which was then reiterated at the Council of Trent, quite explicitly that there was one sacrifice, that there cannot be many sacrifices. It does nothing to disagree with the statement in the Epistle to the Hebrews. St. Augustine, speaking of the death of his mother in the Confessions, said that she went every day to the Eucharist, where there was offered that sacrifice by which we are redeemed. And when she comes before you, O Lord, she will not offer her good works, but she will offer that price which was paid by him whom no one returns the price to, that sacrifice which she received every day. Now, in the Confessions, St. Augustine is very, very clear that his mother attended the sacrifice. But he's, he's also the man who saw to it that the epistle to the Hebrews was put in the New Testament. It's I think the, many of the objections of the reformers are based on misunderstandings of Catholic and Orthodox teaching. Uh, the Orthodox do not use the word transubstantiation. It was a Western term. It came from the Archbishop of Canterbury, Lanfranc, and then St. Thomas wrote further about it. But the Orthodox also believe that the substance changes. The substance of the bread and the substance of the wine change. And to answer another question of, that you raised, the accidents, the appearances, are held in existence by a miracle. You cannot explain their being there by anything other than a miracle. 
So in the Catholic Orthodox churches, the Eucharist is a mystery and a miracle. I'm sad that the reformers who were willing to accept the mystery of Christ, of a divine person who was a human being and who could mysteriously live and die. The great mystery, how did they ever kill a divine person? I'm sorry that the reformers reneged with the faith of the ancient church. I really don't think any serious scholar of patristics could deny that the Eastern and Western fathers, as I've quoted Augustine and John Chrysostom, based on the apostolic fathers, the post-apostolic fathers, believed that the Eucharist is really and truly the body and blood of Christ. So did Luther. So did Luther believe this. One of the strengths of evangelical Protestantism is that it takes the Bible very seriously. It doesn't always get into a hyper-literal interpretation, as uh, Dr. Logan indicated when he suggested that the Catholic and Orthodox interpretations were hyper-literal. What do we do with the prophet Malachi? That in every place, a sacrifice, a pure oblation, will be offered to my name. And that it is a sacrifice of, of bread and wine. Not every propitiatory sacrifice is, in fact, bloody. The sacrifice of Christ was. But to object to the mass that there is no blood is because it is in the order of Melchizedek, the priest who offered bread and wine. So I, I wonder about this question of literalism. Can we be Protestants and not take these words literally? To take the words of Jesus in a literal manner would be to us, number one, to be against the law in Leviticus of drinking blood. Secondly, of cannibalism. And thirdly, to us, it is idolatry to worship the host. And therefore, to us, um, the bread and the wine are symbolic of the, uh, of the body and the blood of Christ. You mentioned Melchizedek. Well, Melchizedek, uh, in the time of Abraham, it is interesting that Melchizedek brought out the bread and the wine. Although that has nothing to do, uh, in essence, with regard to the uh, Lord's Supper, yet it is interesting that Jesus, uh, you know, took bread and wine, and, and these were the symbols of the, of the new covenant. Uh, however, he took bread and wine, and whilst, uh, again, um, the, the Roman Catholics only have the host, and in the host there is supposed to be the body and the blood of Christ. If that is the case, then how come the priest also drinks the wine? Why must he be separated from the laity? Why shouldn't he just have a, a piece of the host himself? Uh, that is just the way the Protestants look at it, that's all. But we, uh, we believe there are times there must be a literal interpretation of the Scriptures. Uh, there are times we believe in figurative. Uh, there are synecdotes. There's poetry. There are all sorts of things in the Scriptures. But uh, when it comes to John chapter 6, for instance, which is the main teaching where you get uh, transubstantiation from. We, from the Reformed view, we don't take that as literal, we take it as, uh, as symbolic. Now Dr. Logan will ask his third and final question. Father, it is impossible for us to abstract from matter the attributes of locality, dimension, and divisibility. But transubstantiation requires us to conceive of Christ's body without all these. Can you please explain it to us Protestants? Well, Cardinal Newman took up that very question before in that quotation 
that I read, why believe that God can make all things and not believe that he can make a body not dependent on place? And why believe that he can create the world and not make bread and wine into the body and blood of his son? So the answer goes back to mystery. Do we stop with our understanding of mystery at the Trinity and the Incarnation, or do we go on to the sacraments and especially to the Eucharist? 